Happy Friday, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Lee in in Seoul. Coming up on today's edition of Business Daily. The government and the ruling party are discussing next year's budget, which they hope will boost the economy and improve people's livelihoods. Starting next year, the way we verify our identities for financial transactions here in Korea may change dramatically, with banks looking to install a blockchain system. These stories and more coming right up. We start things off with an update on the ongoing tainted egg crisis here in Korea. The Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs has announced the interim results of its investigation onto the discovery of contaminated eggs. And for more on this, our Park Hee Jun joins us on the line. So Hee Jun, what can you tell us about these latest results? June, 80 egg farms have been found to have used pesticides as of Thursday night. And 45 of those farms, including 13 that were added to the list today, were found to have dangerous levels of pesticides and are now banned from producing eggs. What's surprising here is that 28 of those farms produce eggs certified as environmentally friendly, which forbids the use of any pesticides. Fripino was detected in seven of the 45 farms, and harmful levels of bifenthrin were found on 34 others, while other varieties of pesticides were also found in the remaining farms. Zufinacron and etoxazole were first discovered yesterday, and peridobin was also found in one of the farms. The discoveries of these new pesticides, which are banned from being used on poultry, are also raising public health concerns. At the moment, the government is disposing the eggs produced on those 45 farms, and the Ministry of Agriculture has just started announcing the final results of its eggs probe, having started just a few minutes ago at 4 p.m. I'll keep you posted with the details and the final results of the eggs inspection. This has been Park ki for Business Daily. Earlier today, the Korean government and the ruling Democratic Party kicked off discussions for next year's budget. They agreed expansionary fiscal policies were needed, especially at a time when the country's economic recovery is seemingly on shaky ground. Our Kim Minji reports. Korea's budget for next year will be increased and drawn up in a way to boost economic growth and to help the government carry out its policy agendas. This came during a meeting between the ruling Democratic Party of Korea and the government on Friday to discuss the details of the 2018 budget ahead of a regular 100-day National Assembly session scheduled to begin in September. Through the budget, we need to change the lives of the people and play a role to take responsibility for people's lives. So the 2018 budget will be centered on the people and focus on revitalizing the economy and people's livelihoods. For starters, the ruling party has requested that the country's defense budget be raised to higher than it was under the previous government amid escalated tensions on the Korean Peninsula. They are also seeking to raise pay for military draftees to about half the minimum wage by 2022, one of the pledges of the new administration. Another core focus is supporting welfare. They plan to reduce the burden on households by supporting education and childcare expenses. On top of that, the budget will also be used to raise the basic pension for senior citizens, step up support for dementia patients, and lend a helping hand to small businesses in the wake of an increase in the minimum wage for next year. The two sides have agreed on the need for active use of fiscal measures, and the government is vowed to carry out expenditure restructuring so that the taxpayers' money is not put to waste and so the fiscal soundness is maintained. In order to implement the government's policy agendas, expansionary fiscal measures are needed. The government is trying to secure some $10 billion by readjusting expenditures. The government will fine-tune the details of the budget plan until a cabinet meeting next week. A government representative is expected to give a speech on next year's budget on November 1st, and rival parties have agreed to put up the bill for a full-floor vote on December 1st after deliberations at the relevant parliamentary committees. Kim min Business Daily. After weeks of wrangling, possible amendments to the Korea-U.S. Free Trade Agreement could be on the cards after all. A special joint session between the two countries' trade representatives will be held next Tuesday upon Washington's request. Our Oh si hung has the latest. It looks like the South Korea-U.S. Free Trade Agreement could soon be back on the drawing board. South Korea's trade ministry says hold on Washington's Joint Committee on the Treaty will hold a special session on Tuesday in the South Korean capital. 
Trade Minister Kim Yeong-jong and his US counterpart Robert Lighthizer will open the discussions via video conference, and additional senior-level talks will follow. The US says its trade representative requested the session last month to consider possible amendments regarding market access in South Korea for US businesses, but most importantly to address the trade imbalance between the two countries. The Trump administration has repeatedly pointed the finger at South Korea's trade surplus with the US, which amounted to roughly 27 billion US dollars in 2016. President Trump himself has labeled the trade pact a horrible deal, calling for revisions to create a level playing field for US companies in Korea, as well as protect American manufacturing. However, figures from the US Trade Representative Office show US shipments of manufactured goods to South Korea had actually grown by 8.4% by 2015, compared to 2011, the year before the FTA took effect. That's double the average pace of growth that America saw in its exports to other countries over the same period. Also, with the US economy being largely service-oriented, as opposed to Korea's comparative advantage in manufactured goods, its service surplus with Korea recorded some $10.7 billion last year, an on-year jump of 30%. In terms of jobs, the figures show America benefited from the creation of 2.6 million jobs in the private sector by 2015, roughly four years into the agreement. Seoul's trade ministry says it will continue to highlight the mutual benefits of the bilateral pact seen over the past five years in trade, investment and employment, and that it would seek the best possible solution after objectively reviewing the treaty's impact on both sides. Also Young Business Daily. Let's now turn to our global business stories from this week with our Eunice Kim joining us in the studio today. Hello, Eunice. Hello. All right, so Korea is preparing to head to review the FTA with the U.S. next week, mm -hmm. while NAFTA talks have already begun. You're absolutely right. Representatives from the U.S., Mexico, and Canada having their kickoff at a hotel in Washington, D.C. Uh, on Wednesday. And as you know, revising the regional NAFTA agreement was one of President Donald Trump's most popular campaign pledges among his ardent supporters. Now, he's called it, quote, the worst deal in the history of the world. And while some would agree it's time to update the trade pact drafted more than two decades ago when things like e-commerce was nowhere as ubiquitous as it is today, U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer made it clear up front that what Washington is shooting for is no facelift. The numbers are clear. The U.S. government has certified that at least 700,000 Americans have lost their jobs due to changing trade flows resulting from NAFTA. Many people believe that the number is much, much bigger than that. The views of the president about NAFTA, which I completely share, are well known. I want to be clear that he is not interested in a mere tweaking of a few provisions and a couple of updated chapters. We feel that NAFTA has fundamentally failed many, many Americans and needs major improvement. So this type of posturing is usually done behind closed doors, and Lighthizer's aggressive tone certainly stood apart from the opening remarks of his Mexican and Canadian counterparts, who presented NAFTA as an overall positive, beneficial for all parties involved. Mexico's economy minister, in fact, said NAFTA was more than just a trade agreement and that it had, in fact, made the three countries think like a region. Now, we know negotiations are still in the early stages, but is there anything that we can glean from what we have seen so far? Well, as uh, we heard from Suyong's earlier report, uh, we are seeing an emphasis on trade deficit mm. figures. So the Trump administration has highlighted a multi-billion dollar trade gap in goods with Mexico and Canada, but economists will argue that focusing on the trade deficit is missing the point. When crafted under the George H. W. Bush and Bill Clinton administrations, NAFTA's goal was to facilitate an integrated regional supply chain which has been created between NAFTA partners. In fact, the top import category from the U.S., uh, from or for the U.S. rather, from both partner countries are cars and car parts, as you see there. Precisely on this point, Lighthizer said the U.S. would want to revisit the, quote, rules of 
origin to require higher NAFTA content and substantial U.S. content. Both Canada and Mexico's position is this would be unprecedented and setting a nation-specific content would greatly complicate the ability of companies to benefit from NAFTA, a position that auto groups from all three countries have backed. The U.S. is also likely to seek moving arbitration from an international panel to domestic courts, which critics say encourages protectionism. Now, shifting our focus a little bit, U.S. President Donald Trump has come under intense fire this week after his comments on last weekend's white supremacist rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, which claimed the life of a counter-protester. That's right. You know, this backlash was so intense that President Trump, as many view it, uh, he was forced to shutter two of his much lauded business councils, and it's beginning to spill over on Wall Street as well. This is the line that triggered the jaw-dropping reaction. Well, I do think there's blame. Yes, I think there's blame on both sides. You look at you look at both sides. I think there's blame on both sides, and I have no doubt about it. And you don't have any doubt about it either. That comment being interpreted to reflect the president's truest belief that there was moral equivalency between the likes of neo-Nazis and the KKK with the, quote, alt-left, as he called them, in light of the deadly result of the weekend rally in Charlottesville, which ended with the death of one counter-protester when a man believed to be a white supremacist drove his car into a crowd. This has sent shockwaves, despite the president being well known for his outlandish statements. And one by one, top CEOs are turning their backs on the U.S. president. It began Monday with Mark's Kenneth Frazier, who resigned from the president's American Manufacturing Council, issuing a statement that said, in part, as CEO of Merck and as a matter of personal conscience, I feel a responsibility to take a stand against intolerance and extremism. No less than six other CEOs followed suit. By Wednesday, President Trump appeared to relent, tweeting he would disband the manufacturing Manufacturing Council and the Strategy and Policy Forum. Condemnation continued to stream in from top political and business leaders. Stepping away from Trump's Strategy Forum, CEO of America's top bank, J.P. Morgan Chase Jamie Dimon, underlined there was no room for hate in a country that draws strength from diversity and humanity. Apple's Tim Cook, who is part of the White House Tech Forum, rejected the notion of moral equivalence between white supremacists and those standing up for human rights. And now people are beginning to wonder out loud whether President Trump has the credibility to push forward his fiscal drive, including those much-awaited tax reforms, Jim. Yeah, right. Well, racism is something that the whole world got to just keep on fighting, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for coming in today. You bet. Moving on to markets, we have our markets contributor, E.G. He, joining us on the line. Hello, G. A. Hello, June. All right, so can you tell us how local stocks performed on the last trading day of the week? Sure. Market concerns eased somewhat after President Moon Jae-in called for renewed talks with North Korea and that the U.S. would need Seoul's consent for any military action on the Korean Peninsula. The local benchmark Kospi closed 0.14% lower at 2,358.37, and the tech-heavy Kospak closed 0.23% higher at 643.58. The market bellwether Samsung Electronics lost 0.3%. Steelmaker POSCO also lost 0.9%. Meanwhile, SK Hynix gained 0.9%, Hyundai Motors gained 035 and Kepco also gained 1.24%. Domestic analysts are also eyeing the upcoming Jackson Hole Policy Conference or the Economic Policy Symposium to be held in Wyoming next week. The summit could provide a hint or two on what global central bankers have in mind with Federal Reserve Chair Janet Yellen and ECB President Mario Draghi expected to to attend. Then how did markets across Asia perform overall this week? 
In the early half of the week, Asian equity markets were broadly higher, with geopolitical tensions easing on the Korean peninsula. But sentiment took another sour turn after an overnight terror attack in Barcelona. Asian shares tracked Wall Street to trade lower today over obstacles in the way of President Donald Trump's fiscal drive and the attack in Barcelona, as mentioned. The S&P 500 suffered its biggest one-day fall since May, down 1.5 percent at the closing bell on Thursday. This followed U.S. corporate leaders abandoning President Trump business councils for his mishandling of white supremacist violence over the weekend. The fall had a knock-on effect as trading got underway in Asia. In Tokyo, the topic fell 1% with the financial sector taking the biggest hit, down 1.7%, while the consumer discretionary sector slid 1.1%. Hong Kong's benchmark Hang Seng Index was down 1.2%, with bank shares down 1.3%, and the real estate sector falling 1.1%. Now, what are analysts saying about the market forecast for the upcoming week? Well, Jiyun, caution still reigns in the market, especially ahead of the joint U.S.-South Korean military exercises planned for next week. But strategists say that this uncharacteristic bull market that we've had for the past couple of months, it is a buying, a better buying opportunity with a sharper one-day sell-off expected during this period. Other analysts say the political drama unfolding in the U.S. is nowhere close to easing, which is likely to keep U.S. investors on their toes for the time being. Risk appetites could remain subdued amid confusion and criticism being directed at the White House, especially over Trump's comments in response to the violence in Charlottesville. This has been Lee Ji-hye for Business Daily. Korea's three major shipyards held on to top spots in the global rankings in order backlogs as of the end of July. According to industry tracker Clarkson Research, Daewoo Shipbuilding and Marine Engineering had the world's largest backlog of any shipyard with 82 pending orders. They represent roughly 5.9 million compensated gross tons, up around 3,000 CGTs compared to the end of June. Hyundai Heavy Industries and Samsung Heavy Industries came in second and third, respectively, followed by their rivals from China and Japan. Meanwhile, other local shipyards like Hyundai Samho Heavy Industries and Hyundai Mipo Dockyard came in ninth and tenth, at risk of being pushed out of the top ten. Korea's biggest automaker, Hyundai Motor, is launching an all-new electric SUV early next year. The planned rollout of these ultra-green vehicles is part of the company's bid to diversify its lineup with more environmentally friendly cars. Our Cha Sang-mi tells us more. Hyundai Motor has unveiled a fuel cell electric vehicle that will go on sale next March. The SUV based on Hyundai's popular Tucson model has better on-the-road performance and outperforms its predecessors in terms of efficiency. It can travel up to 580 kilometers on a single charge, three times the distance of its electric predecessor, the Ionic. We've sharply improved the model compared to our previous iteration, the Tucson fuel cell. We also increased its system efficiency to secure world's highest fuel efficiency. Fuel cell electric vehicles are the ultimate eco-friendly cars. All that's discharged is clean water after the electricity is made through chemical reactions from hydrogen fuel. The car can even purify fine dust as it absorbs outside air and filters it out. The leftover electricity can also be stored and used to power other equipment. Hyundai has opened a hydrogen-powered model house so consumers can experience this cutting-edge technology. Three hydrogen-fueled cars parked outside provide electricity for this model house. It supplies enough energy to run the lights and various home appliances such as fans, air conditioners, and even blenders. The government aims to have 10,000 fuel cell electric cars on Korea's roads by 2020, but that ambitious goal is looking less likely. The vehicles are still very expensive and there are only five charge stations in the country. We plan to first try to lower the production cost and raise consumer awareness. We also need to strategically expand related infrastructure with the help of the government. With high expectations for the wider dissemination of eco-friendly cars, Hyundai Motor aims to develop 31 new models into global markets by 2020. Cha Sang-mi, Business Daily. 
Korea's household debt grew at a faster clip in July compared to the previous month, despite stricter lending rules. According to the Financial Services Commission, tighter loan regulations have not had the desired effect, with 8.3 billion U.S. dollars of debt being added last month, growing more than 25 percent on month. However, the July figure did represent a slight on-year decline of 0.04 percent. With the government's latest real estate measures to curb speculation taking effect this month, the FSC had expected monthly debt to decrease. However, mortgage-backed loans grew roughly $5.8 billion in July, the largest monthly increase in eight months. Banking transactions here in Korea can be a somewhat time-consuming process that involves a lot of paperwork and means of authentication. But starting in the second quarter of next year, many of these hassles will be removed thanks to a new system being adopted by local banks. Our Kim Hae-sung explains. Korean banks are planning to install a blockchain system that could change the way people verify their identities for financial transactions. The blockchain system is an electronic ledger that supports cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, which tracks transactions in sequence across a network of multiple encrypted ledgers. Once banks adopt a blockchain system, there will be no need for a central server or for financial institutions to store data and authorize each transaction individually. The Korea Federation of Banks said they are planning to choose a business operator to install blockchain by next month, begin trial services next February and have it ready for commercial use by the second quarter next year. Currently, users need to get public authentication certificates that require renewal or extension upon expiry every year and go through verification every time they open a bank account. With blockchain, customers will be able to use a common bank certificate created from a PIN number or biometric authentication and use it for all other local banking transactions. High levels of encryption that is frequently updated could help protect the transaction and prevent hacking. And as banks won't need to go through financial intermediaries like the Korea Financial Telecommunications and Clearings Institute, they will be able to save commission charges and computation fee. After installment, Korean banks plan to expand the blockchain system not only for authentication use, but also for payment and overseas remittance. Kim hae Business Daily. With Korea's top two smartphone makers set to unveil new flagship devices this month and Apple expect to follow suit in September, competition in the market is heating up once again. Our Elliot Kim has the story. Samsung Electronics recently announced the date for its Galaxy Note 8's launch event set for August 23rd. Despite holding the largest share of the global smartphone market, the company has a lot to gain from this launch as it hopes to regain users' trust after last year's massive recall of Galaxy Note 7 devices. Exploding batteries on the handset led to everything from airplane bans to the device eventually being pulled completely off the market. Rival LG Electronics has also announced the unveiling of its second flagship device this year. The V30 is set to be revealed on August 31st in Berlin, the night before the start of the Consumer Electronics Show, IFA. The phone is rumored to be one of the few devices compatible with Google's new Daydream VR. After disappointing first-half sales of its current flagship G6, LG is hoping for a positive response to the reveal. Despite rumored supply chain issues, Apple is anticipated to follow its normal launch timeline and announce the 10th anniversary iPhones with all signs pointing to the launch of the iPhone 8. Apple has a lot on the line with competition higher than ever but also a larger-than-ever user base on devices set to be at least three cycles old, shirking the normal two-cycle upgrade timeline. In fact, about 80% of iPhone users are on devices launched in 2014 or earlier. That was the year Apple launched its first iPhone touting a larger screen, the iPhone 6, and also when Apple saw the largest on-year increase in shipments at 37%. Screen bezel sizes are expected to dominate discussions of the three devices, with mock-ups for all three showing different design choices and how small the bezels for all three devices are expected to be. This year's premium smartphone will be differentiated by hardware bezels, with screen borders on front displays being significantly reduced. With margins narrowing and the market becoming oversaturated, consumer response to the three devices could play a decisive role in determining their respective manufacturers' corporate earnings this year. Elliot Kim, Business Daily.
And that wraps it up for today and this week. But we'll be back next week with more of the day's top business stories. So don't forget to tune in then. Thanks for watching. And those of you here in Korea, have a great weekend.